The Holy Gospel according to John chapter 2, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their temples, tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, o Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Creator, the Holy Spirit the Advocate, and Jesus the Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from this present evil age, according to the will of God, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. We might think that the money changers at the temple were exchanging currencies as a convenience, kind of like a human ATM in those days. So the visitors could easily pay their temple tax in the appropriate temple currency, of course. As we remember, the Roman currency had Caesar's image on it, and as such, it could not come into the temple because you can't have graven images. Well, this isn't exactly what they were doing. Yes, they were changing money, but also part of the temple tax and were part of the temple tax machinery. They would exchange the various Mediterranean currencies, Roman denarii, Greek drachma for Jewish shekels and other currencies as well. But their fee for doing this exchange was high. According to Stan Duncan, an economist and theologian, the money changers not only would exaggerate the fees they charged for the exchange transactions, they would also inflate the exchange rate. The result was that for a poor person, the money changers portion of the temple tax was about a day and a half's wage. It's a lot. But the story doesn't end there, no. That was only the beginning. That was before anyone even purchased an animal or a dove for sacrifice. To ensure that your animals were unblemished, you were required to purchase your animals at the gate of the temple, where the prices were higher than out in the countryside. You couldn't raise your own dove and bring it with you, no. It had to be certified as an unblemished animal. To ensure your animals were unblemished, you were required to purchase them at the gate of the temple. In those days, to purchase one pair of doves at the temple was the equivalent of two days' wages for a poor person. But the temple system corruption doesn't stop there either. Now you have your newly purchased doves that you bought at the door, at the gate of the temple, and you went into the temple where your doves or other animals were inspected to make sure the animals you had just purchased outside the temple were in fact unblemished. 
Of course, many, most of these animals were found to be blemished. Then you had to buy two more doves inside the temple for what was the equivalent of 40 days wages. 40. So now we're talking 43 and a half days wages. Josephus, a historian from around 94 of the Common Era, estimated that over 2.2 million people visited Jerusalem during the Passover, which would generate hundreds of millions of dollars. While all of this may appear immoral, none of it was illegal. It was just business, business as usual, and the money changers were just businessmen operating within the law. The temple, the place where Jews who were faithful were to go to worship God, to give thanks to God, to acknowledge their dependence on God, had become so corrupt that it was unrecognizable. So when Jesus entered the temple and experienced this temple-sanctioned extortion of the people, he became angry. He made a whip, drove the money changers out, poured out their coins, turned over their tables, and demanded that they stop making my father's house a marketplace. Stop making the realm of God into the realm of commerce. Jesus doesn't say, stop abusing a good system, but simply, Stop the system. Shut it down. You can see how popular Jesus was with the temple authorities. This was the time they were going to get most of their income for the year. When I was in college, I attended a local church that had a youth group, a young, a young adults group, college age. We were always trying to raise money for our group's various projects. One day, a friend of the church who owned a pear orchard out near Julian invited us to go out and glean his orchard after the harvesters were through. We could sell the fruit and keep whatever we collected for our group, so that was the plan. Well, a few weeks later, we offered freshly harvested pears at a greatly discounted price after church. I was not expecting what I heard. If Jesus were here, he would run you out of the temple. This gentleman clearly saw the commercialization of the temple as a defiling act of the house of God. I hadn't looked at it that way, but as you can tell, I've never forgotten his words. How would our group's activities have changed if we had simply offered the gift that we had received to those around us, giving to others with no expectation of return on the bounty that had, in fact, been given to us. Isn't that how God's economy is supposed to work? Sometimes we forget that we're made in God's image, right? God is generous, and so... Our God-giving nature is to be generous. We are at our best when we inspire generosity, when we open the world around us to experience God's abundant generosity. And this can become contagious, creating more generosity. When, when people understand that God's economy is freely given, it changes them. In our ongoing conversations with God during Lent, this week I invite you to talk to God about generosity. Ask God what he would like you to give, what he would like you to share. Ask God what he needs. What can you give to God? I know we never think about what can we give to God, but that's a good question. Don't be surprised to hear God say he wants everything, your life, and all that you have. After all, 
He's only asking for what is already his. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O oh God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.